In the last episode, we saw how the chemophytes, tentaclostomes, and sarcopods underwent the adaptations necessary to leave the water behind and become the first organisms to live exclusively on dry land. But evolution isn't a linear process, and as these groups make the transition to land, they'll continuously diversify to fill the myriad niches offered by their new terrestrial habitat. To begin with, the environment our alien organisms find themselves in having emerged from the water will be warm, wet, and tropical. Our alien planet has a higher average temperature than Earth and less seasonal variation. Plus, the abundant hydrogen sulfide undergoes a series of reactions in the upper atmosphere to form sulfuric acid, around which will condense voluminous clouds that bring acid rain. On top of that, the high temperatures and single enormous oceans serve as a mechanism for generating gigantic storm systems called hypercanes, larger than any storm seen on Earth. All of these factors mean the mainland will be perpetually drenched by massive bouts of acid rain, which will erode the mountains into weather-beaten crags and valleys, and carve out huge river courses and deltas, and much of the land will be taken up by waterlogged marshes and bogs. This warm, wet climate will be ideal for the chemophytes, which will pave the way for the first terrestrial ecosystems. Just as in the oceans, the primary energy sources for terrestrial organisms will be sunlight and atmospheric hydrogen sulfide both of which are used by the chemophytes to power their autotrophic reactions. The first chemophytes will be small, slime mold-like organisms, no more than a few centimeters tall at the most. But the clade from which the terrestrial plants descend, which we'll call xenophytes, will evolve the specialized tissues necessary to grow roots and stems to take up minerals from the soil and grow upwards to gather more sunlight. And one clade of these plants, which we'll call the xylophytes, may then evolve tough support tissues to let them grow into the first trees. Before the animals come ashore, there'll be nothing around to eat these plants, with one notable exception. Saprotrophs are organisms that absorb nutrients from dead or decaying organic matter. The most recognizable saprotrophs on Earth are fungi, but saprotrophy also exists among bacteria and even some plant species as well. In these ancient forests, dead plant matter represents an as-of-yet unexploited source of nutrients, so it's very likely that a clade of chemophyte will evolve a saprotrophic lifestyle. The chemophytes may be especially suited for saprotrophy because organic decomposition gives off hydrogen sulfide, from which chemophytes derive a portion of their energy. One clade of chemophyte may adapt their roots to absorb more hydrogen sulfide and other nutrients from the bountiful leaf litter that covers the forest floor. As they specialize for this mode of nutrition, they may no longer rely on photosynthesis to obtain sugars, and so their leaves may shrink, possibly even forsaking their algal symbiotes and so losing their reddish coloration. These chemophytes, which I'll call necrophytes, will be the first terrestrial decomposers, organisms that break down the detritus that litters the ground and recycle the nutrients, a role vital for all ecosystems. Things will remain this way until the tentaclostomes launch their invasion of land, which is likely to occur alongside or very shortly after the first terrestrial plants. The early amphibious forms may flourish around the water's edge, but the lophostomes will have the advantage in inland habitats. The first lophostomes will likely be adaptable generalists, since they won't have had much time to specialize for living in the forests. In this new environment, their survival rates may be fairly low, so they'll be incentivized to reproduce quickly and frequently to maintain a stable population. This strategy of rapid reproduction is sometimes called R-selection. R-selected species are those who produce large numbers of offspring, of which only a small proportion survive. R-selected species tend to be small, have short lifespans, and often thrive when colonizing new habitats. The sessile anthostomes also exhibit this mode of reproduction with their broadcast spawning, and so the lophostomes may inherit similar reproductive tendencies, producing thousands of eggs in a single spawning, the majority of which will die before reaching maturity. As these lophostomes proliferate, they'll undergo a spurt of rapid diversification to fill all the various available niches, what's called an adaptive radiation. One clade of lophostomes may exploit the niches of small-bodied creatures, shrinking down to only a few centimeters long. Below a certain size, their shell won't provide any decent protection, and so isn't needed and may be lost entirely. A small size also means they won't weigh very much, and so will need comparatively little muscular effort to support themselves, so their stubby legs may become longer and more flexible, which will also let them climb plant stems and burrow through leaf litter. Because they're so low to the ground, even the tiniest variation in terrain may obstruct their line of sight, 
so their eye stalks may lengthen into periscope-like structures to let them see over obstacles and increase their field of view. These tiny lophostomes will exploit similar niches to those filled by arthropods on Earth, and, much like the arthropods, they may reach staggering levels of diversity. Arthropods account for over 80% of all animal species. The total species count of all chordates, mollusks, flatworms, and roundworms combined wouldn't even be equal to the number of beetle species alone. We'll touch on this again later, but one of the primary drivers of biodiversity is habitat variation, which is much more appreciable on small scales, so our tiny lophostomes may reach levels of profusion comparable to the arthropods. Also like arthropods, they may maintain the R-selected tendencies of the earlier lophostomes, as R-selection tends to be favoured at small body sizes, since the only real way they can defend themselves against larger predators is to reproduce faster than the rate at which their predators can eat them, much like the tachypods that constitute the majority of marine plankton. I'll call these tiny creatures malacaforms. Their diversity may be too great to adequately catalogue, but we can still map out several major lineages. Early on in their evolution, some clades may specialize for feeding on plants, forming the first link in the food chain. Some may evolve their manipulator limbs into cutting tools to crop and process the softer tissues around the leaves and branches, while others may evolve compact, robust mouth parts to bore through the harder tissues around the stems and roots, while still others may evolve a proboscis ringed with sharp serrations to pierce the plant's outer cuticles and suck out the nutrient-rich vascular fluids. As these herbivorous clades establish themselves, other clades of malacaforms may evolve to feed on them. Some may adapt their tentacles into sharp, fang-like claws for impaling and butchering prey, while others may evolve longer, whip-like tentacles to ensnare and restrain their prey. And some may evolve to become scavengers or detritivores, feeding on carrion and decaying organic matter along with the necrophytes. Each of these groups may contain thousands of species, and they'll form the basis of just about every terrestrial ecosystem across the planet. While the malacaforms may be incredibly diverse, other lophostone clades may maintain a decent size as well as a hard shell. And as the oxygen levels increase with the proliferation of the forests, they'll be poised to attain comparatively large body sizes, though they'll still be limited by their lack of skeletal support structure and inefficient breathing mechanism. At their size, they won't need long eye stalks to see further, so they may shrink into compact, muscular turrets to reduce their likelihood of being damaged, though they can still be swiveled forward and back to increase their field of vision. And as these forms specialize for terrestrial life, one clade may see a radical innovation in their digestive systems. We've said the entire gastrozoan branch of the anthostome evolutionary tree has a blind gut, meaning they eat and excrete waste out of the same opening. This isn't very efficient, since newly swallowed food gets mixed in with food that's already been digested. On Earth, many clades have secondarily evolved a through gut from an ancestral blind gut, so the same thing may happen in the lophostomes. Perhaps in one innovative clade, the gut evolves a sort of partition to form into a U-shaped tract with separate canals for ingestion and excretion. This development will help them extract more nutrients from their food than other clades, and so these lophostomes, which I'll call diplostomes, may become the dominant group of large land animals in these ancient forests. A larger body size may also result in these diplostomes shifting from R selection to K selection. Instead of reproducing in vast numbers like R selected species, K selected species produce fewer offspring, but invest more heavily in those offspring to foster a higher chance of them surviving. K selection tends to be favoured by species that are large, have relatively long lifespans, or live in crowded ecosystems or at high population densities. The diplostome's increasing size may therefore occur alongside a decrease in the number of fertilised eggs they produce in any given clutch. From the several thousand eggs in the ancestral lophostomes, to only a few hundred or even several dozen in larger forms. Keep in mind R and K selection exists on a spectrum, and most species will exist somewhere between the two extremes, and some species may even alternate between them. For instance, the chemophytes reproduce asexually to let them colonize new or sparsely populated habitats, like an R-selected species, but in areas that are already colonized or densely populated, they switch to sexual reproduction to maximize genetic variation and they package their fertilized spores within a diaspore to increase their chances of survival, like a K-selected species, which is actually very similar to what many species of fungi do on Earth. 
The diplostomes may become increasingly case selected as they evolve larger body sizes, which will be facilitated by the increase in atmospheric oxygen as well as their efficient digestive systems. An immediate advantage provided by their complex guts is an improved ability to cope with the tough, indigestible tissues of large plants, and so most early diplostomes may be herbivorous. One clade may specialize for herbivory by evolving some of their feeding arms into long tentacles to reach for food, while the remaining arms may broaden and become covered with row upon row of rasping teeth for masticating vegetation before swallowing. The abundance of food in the ancient forests may let this clade further increase in size to the upper limit of what their boneless bodies will allow. As they grow larger, their legs may thicken with rings of muscle to support a greater weight, possibly losing the ability to be retracted within the body. But the evolution of large herbivores will create a niche for predators that feed on them, and so it will only be a matter of time before one clade of diplostomes evolves carnivory. This transition may begin with a clade that evolves to supplement their diet by subsisting on malacaforms or by scavenging carrion, gradually becoming generalist omnivores. These species may be smaller than their herbivorous cousins, and so won't be quite as robustly built, and their generalist lifestyle may require more mobility than dedicated herbivory, involving behaviors such as digging or climbing, so their shells may become thinner and narrower so as to not hinder their movement. We'll call these creatures stenostracans, which form a sister clade to the fully herbivorous diplostomes, or placostracans. One clade of stenostracans may fill the niches of adaptable opportunists, while the placostracans continuously and indiscriminately gorge on the bountiful vegetation, these creatures may be more selective in their feeding, so some of their tentacles may evolve into antennae packed with scent organs to probe the leaf litter for anything edible. Eventually, however, another clade of stenostracans may complete the transition to carnivory by specializing to feed on larger prey, becoming the first ever terrestrial macropredators. This transition may be facilitated by one major development, being apex predators, defense isn't a priority for this clade, while speed and maneuverability are critical to successful hunting. So this new predatory clade may reduce their shells even further than other stenostracans. But rather than losing the shell completely, like the malacaforms, they may instead internalize it as a rigid structure within their body. Since the shell no longer provides any protection, it may become diminished into a long, flexible structure that provides internal support much like the gladius of squids, or indeed, like the backbones of vertebrates. This structure now serves as a site of muscle attachment, giving them greater leverage and making walking much more efficient. They still won't be able to run with any great speed, but they'll easily outpace the bulky herbivores they feed on. To pierce through their prey's armor, their tentacles may truncate and become lined with tooth-like barbs to deliver powerful bites. I'll call these forms coleostracans, in response to these new predators, the other diplostome clades will need to undergo defensive adaptations. The large placostracans may simply thicken their shells and evolve extra armor, while the smaller omnivorous stenostracans will still need to maintain a degree of flexibility, so they may divide their shells into bands to provide protection without restricting their movement, possibly even evolving the ability to curl into a defensive ball. I'll call this clade the desmostracans. All of these various clades of Lophostome will enjoy millions of years of unrivaled dominion over the land, before the Sarcopods come ashore to challenge their supremacy. Like the early Lophostomes, the first osteopods will likely tend towards our selection to help them quickly colonize their new habitat, and to that end, they might employ a unique reproductive capability. We said in part 2 that the ancestral polypod was dioecious, that is, having a distinction between male and female individuals. But what if we add a slight variation to this? What if, like some species of fish, amphibians, and arthropods on Earth, the sarcopods and the osteopods from which they descend exhibit sequential hermaphroditism, wherein they may alter their sex at some point during their life cycle? This contrasts with the lophostomes, whose larvae don't have any sexual characteristics at all, and it's only once they reach maturity that they become either male or female, and remain as that sex for the rest of their lives. The osteopod sequential hermaphroditism may provide an advantage because in any population where the proportion of males and females is unbalanced, an individual can change their sex to increase the likelihood of finding a mate and helping the population remain stable. Unlike the early lophostomes, the first osteopods will evolve among an already crowded ecosystem, so for the osteopods to adapt to any terrestrial niches, they'll need to compete with the dominant lophostome clades. 
but the osteopods are provided with a considerable advantage from their internal skeletons and efficient breathing systems, which will grant them much greater potential size and maneuverability than the lophostomes. As the skeleton evolves, the osteopods may split into two lineages. One may evolve multiple flexible limb girdles for increased mobility and speed, while the other may evolve a single fused limb girdle to support a larger body size. We'll call these two lineages Poliskians and Siniskians, respectively. The early Poliskians will be small and adaptable omnivores, relying on their speed and agility to survive, while the Siniskians' robust skeletons will allow them to specialize for the niches of large ground dwellers, rapidly becoming the biggest land animals on the planet. As they get larger, their feet will broaden, since if the feet are too narrow, they'll sink into the ground, which would be especially problematic in the muddy swamps that cover much of the landscape. Unlike tetrapods on Earth, their feet won't bear any digits, instead consisting of a single toe-like claw with gripping surfaces on the underside. Earth's tetrapods inherited their fingers and toes from their lobe-finned fish ancestors, but the sarcopods from which the osteopods descend have hydraulic feet instead of fins and have no digits to speak of, so the osteopods will likewise be toeless. The rise of these new clades will spark an evolutionary battle between the lophostomes and the osteopods for dominance of the terrestrial ecosystems. The competitive exclusion principle states that no two species can occupy the same niche in the same ecosystem without one outcompeting the other. None of the lophostome clades can attain the same size that the Siniskians can, nor do they have the speed and maneuverability of the Poliskians, and so they may begin losing ground, but extinction isn't the only possible outcome. Niche partitioning is the process whereby species competing for the same niche undergo adaptations for a more specific realization of that niche, such that they can coexist. For example, the various species of animals found on the Caribbean islands, while all filling the general niche of tree-dwelling insectivores, avoid competition with each other by living in different microhabitats defined by specific types of vegetation and levels of sunlight and moisture. The competing clades of lophostomes and osteopods may do something similar, evolving to live in different habitats and competing for different resources. For example, the Desmostricans and Poliskians, both comprising adaptable omnivores, may avoid competition with each other by specializing for different diets. The Poliskians may take advantage of their mobility to climb and live among tree branches, where they may feed on leaves and mixed plant matter in addition to scavenging and hunting small prey. Their mandibles may broaden into chisel-like structures to help cope with a variety of food items, as well as to chew through the tough outer cuticles of the trees and search for wood-boring malacophorms. To help them climb trees and clamber over rough terrain, the gripping surfaces on their feet may evolve claws, and their limbs may lengthen to span the gaps between branches. Living in trees also serves as a defensive adaptation, as they'll be out of reach of many of the large ground predators and many species may complement this with camouflage patterns to let them blend into the red leaves of the surrounding foliage. These will be some of the first ever arboreal animals, living in a similar way to rodents or prosimians. I'll call these creatures platydonts. The competition from these adaptable osteopods may have an impact on the desmostricans, possibly resulting in many generalist species going extinct and forcing the remaining species to adopt a more specialized lifestyle. They won't be able to exploit tree climbing niches nearly as well as the platodonts, and so may instead remain at ground level and specialize to feed on the abundant malacoforms among the leaf litter, especially since the malacoforms don't require very much speed to prey upon. On Earth, animals that occupy analogous niches may be called insectivores, but of course, on this alien planet, there are no insects. So for our purposes, I'm going to coin the term malacovore to describe their feeding habits. To specialize for this lifestyle, some of their tentacles may elongate into whip-like organs to snap up any malacoforms they unearth, which will then get crushed between the grinding surfaces of the two spade-like lower tentacles. Since this lifestyle demands less mobility than that of their adaptable ancestors, they may become bulkier and more heavy-set, forsaking a life clambering among the understory and now remaining exclusively at ground level. Similarly, the Placostricans may avoid competition with the herbivorous Siniscians by specializing to feed on different types of vegetation. The Siniscians may take advantage of their size to exploit the niches of large browsers, evolving long pedipalps to reach into high branches. These pedipalps may terminate in hooked claws to pull leaves towards the muscular mouth, and their cephalothorax may enlarge to accommodate an expanded foregut to tackle tough woody vegetation. 
we'll call these lumbering beasts Megalobrachids. These adaptations, along with their great size, will mean the Megalobrachids will be able to feed on vegetation well out of the Placostrican's reach. So the Placostricans may respond to this by specialising for the niches of heavy grazers, feeding on low vegetation on the forest floor, and as such, their feeding tentacles, no longer used to reach upward for food, may become shorter and used for foraging among leaf litter or digging for roots. Among predatory clades, niche partitioning may drive the evolution of new hunting tactics. If a clade of Poliskians evolves to become predators, they may make use of their speed to specialise for pursuit hunting. Their hind legs may elongate and align to become parallel with the body for a more directional application of force, allowing them to accelerate explosively. Their eyes may move forward towards the front of the cephalothorax to provide them with increased depth perception, and their pedipalps may evolve sharp cutting surfaces to butcher their kills. This collection of traits will give them the speed and weaponry to chase down fast quarry like the platodonts, and to exploit similar niches to those occupied by foxes and other canids on Earth. I'll call them Dromeopods. The Dromeopods may outcompete many of the predatory Coleostricans, but those that survive may avoid competition by specialising for ambush tactics. Their gladius may evolve to become increasingly lighter and more elastic, so that when the muscles within the back contract, they bend the gladius into a curve, storing energy like a bow, and when the muscles release, the gladius snaps back into its original shape, propelling the animal forward in a sort of bounding lunge. This may lead to them evolving a bizarre, inchworm-like mode of locomotion, as well as an impressive jumping ability, which they may make ample use of to escape larger predators or to ambush prey. Many species may undergo further niche partitioning by evolving to live among tree branches that are too high or precarious for the dromeopods, which are primarily adapted for life in the understory. Their walking legs may lose their weight-bearing capabilities and evolve to grip and cling to tree branches like forceps, as well as to anchor themselves in place when lunging at prey. With these adaptations, these diplostomes, which I'll call elastospondyls, will become the most mobile lophostomes yet, perhaps efficient to become prolific arboreal ambush predators, feeding on the malacoforms and platodonts they share the trees with. The megalobrachids, however, may be too large to serve as suitable targets for either the elastospondyls or the dromeopods, which are specialised for hunting small, fast prey. But once again, where there's a gap in the food chain, something will inevitably evolve to fill it. In this case, early on in the Siniskians' history, the same stock from which the Megalobrachids diverged may give rise to a clade of large carnivores. They may use their strong pedipalps to grab and restrain prey, while their eyes, much like those of the dromeopods, may cluster towards the front of the cephalothorax to help them zero in on prey. Their mandibles may lengthen and become more heavily muscled, while their teeth may extend and sharpen to slice through flesh. These creatures will become the new apex predators of these early ecosystems, and the largest carnivores of their time. However, despite their size and ferocity, they may still retain some of the omnivorous tendencies of the ancestral Siniskians, allowing them to subsist on vegetation or carrion if need be, somewhat like bears or the extinct entelodonts on Earth. We'll call these creatures Dynagnathans, and with that, our terrestrial ecosystems are looking fairly well fleshed out, and our two body plans have seen some major developments along the way. As always, keep in mind that these are only the major groups we're detailing here, and there are likely to be innumerable other clades that come and go alongside them. This will serve as a rough outline for the sorts of ecosystems that may develop in the first 50 million years or so following the appearance of the first lophostomes. But there are omens of change on the horizon, the climate is becoming cooler and drier, and the tropical forests are thinning. The stable, hospitable habitats our species have thrived in thus far won't last forever, and so these clades will need to adapt to a changing world or face extinction. In the next episode, we'll see how these clades leave the ancient forests behind and undergo further diversification to conquer a variety of new habitats across the supercontinent.